So this limitation of only being able to interact with the greater universe through light is something that might change. And again, this is the exciting promise that maybe, probably not in the next decade, but within the next few decades, we may have other kinds of astronomy, other kinds of ways of sampling the universe out there. So for example, electromagnetic radiation light is produced by moving charged particles. Now, I'm going to talk about gravitational waves. And this is where you have a mass in motion. And it arises out of the... There's a, a wave solution to Einstein's uh, field equations of general relativity. Don't worry about that. Just take it as red. But one of the predictions from general relativity is that as masses move... Well, you've got a stationary mass. You plonk it in the middle of space. Space curves around it. The greater the mass, the more distorted space is around it. Now imagine that mass moves, then that distortion has to change. And gravitational waves are the ripples within the space-time that move out, sending the message of the change of curvature of space. And they move out at the speed of light from any mass in motion. Now that mass has to be accelerating, so it could be spinning, it could be tumbling, and that motion can't be cylindrically or spherically symmetric, it has to be slightly asymmetric. But within that, there are plenty of chances where you can create strong gravitational waves. So, for example, imagine a, dumb, a dumbbell shape, you know, a bone shape. If that's spinning around its, its axis of symmetry, it's not going to create gravitational waves. But if it tumbles end over end, it's no longer an axisymmetric, you know, a perfect symmetrically situation. It's going to create um, gravitational waves because it's going to rattle up the space-time around it. The more mass there is, the faster it moves, the more gravitational waves are going to move out and ripple out through space-time away from it. So examples of this could be where you have neutron stars or black holes in orbit around it. It could be asymmetric expansion of a supernova when it goes bang at the end of a massive star's life. It could be the merger of two black holes, or it could be an asymmetric black hole in rotation. These really energetic events have the potential to create gravitational wave astronomy. Now, we know gravitational waves exist. This is an observation from um, Holson-Taylor in 1974, where they had two neutron stars in rotation around each other, one of which was giving off those pulse signals that made it a pulsar. The rate of energy, I mean, affecting this, this pulse signal was slowing down, showing that these neutron stars were losing energy. Every time they gave off a gravitational wave, there's an incremental loss of energy, which affects their in-spiraling, slows them down. And the amount of energy that was being given off from this matches exactly what you'd expect from gravitational waves. So we expect gravitational waves out to be out there. The trouble is actually detecting them. They're very, very small ripples in the curvature of space-time. We only have a hope of detecting the most violent, the most explosive event, like a merger of two supermassive black holes when two galaxies collide somewhere in the sky, or maybe two neutron stars merging somewhere within our galaxy. And those kind of really um, explosive or, or highly energetic events are also the most rare. And so the prospects, you know, again, this is really forward-thinking astronomy. The great thing about gravitational waves is that they will pass through solid objects and they, we can, it gives us the chance to penetrate regions that are inaccessible to light. So how do you detect a gravitational wave? How do you detect a change in space around you? And there's a characteristic signature that in any one direction, the gravitational wave is going to compress and stretch and compress and stretch space and everything within it in a regular manner. And in one direction, that stretch and compression is going to be carrying on in one rate, and in a direction perpendicular, is going to be out of phase. So imagine you have an experiment where you can measure distances on this, you know, minute changes in distance between, two, say, two arms of an experiment, and you look in one direction and perpendicular to that direction. You're looking for this rhythmic change that is slightly out, that's out of phase completely in the two different directions, that show you a gravitational has gone past and just squeeze space-time as it, as it went through. 
The level of detection is minute. It's very difficult to do. We've been looking for gravitational waves for over five decades and have yet to really put our hand on our hearts and say we've detected some. But again, there are new and more advanced experiments coming online that hold the potential for this new kind of astronomy. So, for example, uh, this is a video from the LIGO experiment. There's going to be a new, improved, advanced LIGO experiment that starts up later this year. Further along the line, we've got an experiment called ELISA. This is due, I mean, we're talking 2030 at best for the launch of this experiment. Later this year, there's going to be a a kind of test mission called LISA Pathfinder that's going to be launched by the European Space Agency, which will just test one small component within this satellite. The ultimate idea is that you have three satellites, each kilometer, a million kilometres away from each other, floating through space and making those precision distance, um, distance measurements between the three satellites, again, looking for those tiny, tiny variations that might happen to go past if there happens to be some major chaotic event going on somewhere in our galaxy or elsewhere in the universe. So this is very, very technologically challenging, but it has the potential to give us a completely new window on the universe. This would give us a new astronomy. And there isn't just gravitational wave astronomy. There's another form of astronomy which, again, is on the verge of opening up. And again, it may be a decade or a couple of decades before we can use it. But there isn't just light everywhere in the universe. There are neutrinos. Neutrinos, those neutral little particles that just flood the universe. You know, there's of the level of about 100 every cubic centimetre. These are emitted through nuclear reactions. So you're looking at maybe nuclear fusion. You're looking at radioactive decay. If you could detect, if you could see the sky in terms of the neutrinos streaming towards us from different sources, you would be sampling something completely different. The light that we detect comes from the surface of objects, the neutrinos emitted from the heart of objects, from the heart of stars, from the core, say, of a supernova collapse. This would give us, again, a completely different view of the processes and the physics going on out there that is not reliant on light. Trouble with neutrinos is they, we can see into the heart of things because they don't actually they flood through matter. They don't interact with matter. We can only detect you know one neutrino in millions that stream past us when they interact with some ordinary matter and produce like a flash of light. Here's another bond layer down in the um, Antarctic. This is an ice cube experiment that's looking to detect some of these ultra high energy neutrinos, which would come from the most exciting objects out there in the universe. So far, we've discovered neutrinos from the sun. We detect neutrinos when supernova 1987A went off. And probably we've amassed 20 to 30 high energy neutrinos so far that come from somewhere outside our galaxy. That we're not detecting huge numbers yet, enough to do neutrino astronomy. But the great thing about neutrinos is because they don't carry electric charge, they're not deflected by the magnetic fields of the galaxy in their way to us. When we do start detecting them, we'll be able to know where they're being emitted from. We'll be able to look at the sky within neutrinos and, again, get a completely different view of the cosmos out there.